Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. So I've got with me now in the studio probably Australian lobbyist of the year, I would say, uh, Dr. Rachel Carling, uh, CEO of uh, Right to Life uh, New South Wales. Thank you for joining me. No problem. Lovely to be here with you, Tim. Now, obviously, you've been on the ground in New South Wales these uh, past few months uh, with the the Right to Life campaign when the uh, Abortion Decriminalisation Act was sprung, not just on the parliament, but the people of of New South Wales. So it would have been a very uh, gruelling uh, time for you, but uh, obviously there were those key uh, amendments to protect the nearly born, which obviously the, the bill still passed, but there were still significant protections uh, in in those bills. So uh, congratulations on at least because it was a mass mobilization. And as a Victorian, it's been quite uh, demoralizing over the past few years being a, a a pro-lifer, but uh, it's certainly given the rest of the nation hope. That's great, Tim. I'm really pleased that it has. We certainly were taken off guard in New South Wales. I was very new to the role as well. I'd been there for less than two weeks when the bill was announced, and we just had to really hit the ground running and come together as a pro-life community to really fight as hard as we could against the bill, with some very good results in the end. Now, I mentioned the uh, Victorian uh, demoralising. Uh, in case people don't know, you had a previous life as a Victorian uh, MLC uh, from uh, 2014 to, to 2018. And Victoria's Abortion Law Reform Act was basically the, the model for all of these uh, abortion decriminalisation uh, bills that have popped up all across the country, passed in, in Queensland, Tasmania. They're doing something similar in New Zealand at the moment. And when when you were an MLC, that was Daniel Andrews's, his first term. He didn't have a, a majority in the state uh, upper house, so you were one of the, the key uh, uh, crossbenchers. Uh, but um, it's still... Daniel Andrews, he still managed to to take the abortion, uh, Victoria's abortion laws to an even more uh, extreme level when uh, there's the, the 150 uh, metre exclusion zones outside uh, Victorian abortion law clinics, and it's been held up by the, the High Court, Cathy Club, and the, the Human Rights Law Alliance, which is run by the Australian Christian Lobby, unsuccessfully tried to challenge that. And then, of course, it wasn't talked about in the 2014 state election, but Daniel Andrews uh, sprung euthanasia uh, legislation on right, the Victorian Parliament. Uh, that passed as well, came into uh, effect uh, earlier this year. You spoke at the, the vigil the, the night before. You, uh, during your time, tried to introduce a infant viability act that was unsuccessful. Uh, so, so obviously, uh, you, uh, as a legislator, have seen just how difficult it is to affect pro-life legislation. It is very hard to affect change from within. And one thing we need to remember about Daniel Andrews, he was the health minister in 2008 who introduced the abortion law into Victoria as well. So he has quite a history here in Victoria. Um, well, and quite a reputation Australia-wide as being one of the progressive, I always hate that term, I'm sure you do too, um, leaders in the pro-choice space. So it shouldn't have come to um, much of a surprise really that he went for euthanasia in our term as well. I mainly get told off by my audience for using the word progressive. They say, no, you should use regressive. Oh, it's definitely regressive. And as you said, it, it really is demoralising for us as a pro-life community when we see um, leaders like Daniel Andrews being so successful. Uh, you switched to a lower house campaign at the 2018 uh, state election uh, for the seat of, of Werribee. you uh, were based out in in Melbourne's uh, west, which is, it's it's always been a safe Labor uh, stronghold. But uh, I know that uh, the Liberals and other Conservatives are slowly making inroads. But at the moment, it's just Bernie Finn, uh, the the Liberal MLC, who's probably Victoria's strongest pro-life uh, MP. He's he's still holding the the, the fort there, at the, the the west at the moment. But it's a, a demographically changing area. 
Oh, absolutely. And one of the reasons why it is such a stronghold is it's not challenged. And it's no longer a stronghold, really. Tim Pallas's um, margin is much smaller now than it ever has been before. And that's the seat of Werribee where I challenged. And I think that we need to be out there challenging. Pro-lifers need to be in politics. And even though Daniel Andrews did pass even more anti-life laws during his first term in Parliament, which he didn't take to the 2014 election, the exclusion zones, that was actually a private member's bill by Fiona Patton, which right. uh, Jill Hennessy and Daniel Andrews took and championed uh, themselves. Daniel Andrews won a landslide uh, re-election. There, there wasn't much of a conservative choice for voters in terms of the minor party seen Australian Conservatives didn't contest, neither did Pauline Hanson's One Nation. And so not only did Daniel Andrews increase his majority in the lower house, uh, but uh, he also got a more friendly upper house uh, where uh, his legislative, a few bills that he didn't get through in the last parliament, he looks like it'll be much easier uh, to, uh, to get them passed uh, in this parliament. And I recall you saying at the the euthanasia uh, vigil the, the night before, which you spoke at, that a lot of the, the pro-life Liberal MPs lost their seats during that uh, election. For example, uh, Graham Watts, he lost his seat of Burwood, Burwood. And we also saw Michael Gidley lose his seat of uh, Mount Waverley. And it was basically in the, the east where the, that wipeout uh, was. And it was Absolutely. pretty incredible. Robert Clark, yes. who held the safe seat of Box Hill. Um, supposedly. Um, the seat of Hawthorne was also lost. It was quite devastating and it was very deliberately um, skewed towards going after the men in the lower house who had spoken out against euthanasia. Now, as we've, you've lived in Victoria for, for most of your uh, life, but now you're a New South Wales mm -hmm. lobbyist. And as you said, you'd, you'd only been in the role two weeks before this uh, abortion decriminalisation bill was, was was sprung. But obviously it's a different jurisdiction. I, I just want to get uh, an indication of sort of what, uh, what was your, I guess, uh, interview pitch to, to Right to Life New South Wales? Like, what did, what did you want to do? I was actually headhunted. So they didn't actually advertise my job. So I was headhunted because they knew they had the foresight to know that an abortion bill and possibly a euthanasia bill were on the um, horizon in the near future. So they headhunted me, particularly because of the way um, I've worked inside parliament and outside parliament on pro-life issues. Yes. The, uh, the... And you are right. It's such a different jurisdiction, even just, to, just across the border, um, but completely different. The churches are more active, for example. There's more of a church going population and there's a natural home there for a lot of the pro-life movement. Um, but there was also just a much more friendly and more um, outspoken set of MPs and MLCs in New South Wales compared to what we've had in Victoria. As you said, uh, they were expecting uh, the, the New South Wales pro-life lobby that this legislation was, was coming, but it still took that it was basically announced on the Saturday night and then it was going to go into the parliament on the Monday. So basically, Saturday night, most people are sort of out and about and then you get this alert that it's coming on Monday. And so what what do you what do you do given that you've been in the the role two weeks? How do you react in that in that situation? We mobilised very, very quickly. Um, as, as you indicated, they had said to us, the pro-choice groups had believed that they would get this legislation through in one sitting week, both lower house and upper house in one sitting week, which would have been completely unprecedented. Uh, I guess it was worth a try. They did not expect the reaction. They did not expect the sheer force of numbers that we brought out. So we knew that it was going to be extremely hard when we just um, we didn't get a copy of the bill until the Sunday and it was going to be debated on the Tuesday at that stage. So we just simply started getting our phone calls out um, and getting people literally physically outside Parliament House to stand against the bill. Now, you've already said that uh, New South Wales, it has a, a very more active uh, local church community network and just general uh, pro-life uh, 
groups, uh, be uh, because obviously it's primarily the, the church Christian uh, community, but uh, anyone uh, who believes in basic biology and science, well, they should be uh, pro-life. Uh, pro and I think everyone's sort of used to think as Queensland is the most conservative state, but I would say New South Wales is basically because of the success of, of the, the campaign. Obviously, uh, there was, when people learnt about it, they had their natural revulsion to it, but you've also got to help mobilise and manage and, and make sure that the, because it is all about uh, optics, as they say, to make sure that the, the demonstration outside Parliament, the the letters to emails to MPs are all uh, respectful. There's there's no sort of abuse mm -hmm. and that's that sort of thing. And obviously, there's uh, social media. Uh, well, it's it's not just you've got to uh, get your message out there, but in a way that's not going to sort of violate the community standards. So there's a lot to 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 manage and filter and. Oh. Absolutely. There certainly were a lot of uh, balls juggling in the air. And one of the other effective things that we did during the campaign was a postcard campaign. We printed tens of thousands of postcards with very simple messages about love them both and stand for life, pro-woman, pro-life, pro-child. And they were sent in their thousands into the MPs and then the MLC's offices, which was a really tangible reminder because it's so easy to delete emails. Mm. It's really easy to set up an automatic delete or an automatic go into a sent fo you know, into a folder. Tricks. And oh, we did it all the time, absolutely. If there was something we really weren't that interested in, we were starting to get a flood of emails, they just went into a folder. <laughs> we counted the number, but there was no way that we read them. I'll just be really honest. <laughs> MPs and MLCs don't read these things. Maybe staff might, um, but even that's very unlikely with the limited staffing resources most backbenchers have. So um, we wanted to put something tangibly in people's hands. So people, when they came into their offices, the, the parliamentarians would see our postcards on their desk and they would see the, exactly the same signs um, as the postcards were reflecting outside as they were walking into parliament every single day. And we maintained a vigil at some stages for 24 hours a day outside parliament and we could be clearly clearly heard within that house and this is why you were successful in the role because as you just said you knew you knew all the the tricks and i think that is the, the all the signs of basically a, pers a person who has learnt like had some demoralizing but taken the lessons mm -hmm. and obviously it was a different jurisdiction different culture but you were you were able to to take uh, your experience as well, a person who was lobbied. That's true. Uh, into mm. uh, know how to how to lobby, and yes. so basically, yeah, I can understand why they they had hunted you. They they made the uh, the right decision to put mm. their faith in you. There are a lot of people in the pro choice pro choice community that aren't very happy with me being there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, but that's, that's another. Like, well, that's, that's another bonus, isn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it was a very successful campaign, I think, um, given the time limits we had. And we also had some friendly media in New South Wales, yes. which really surprised me considering coming from Victoria, where we have a very unfriendly mainstream media. Uh, we were very um, fortunate to be able to make some connections with the female reporters in particular. And I can remember having an argument with one of them at one stage where they were saying, you know, it's a limited abortion bill. I was saying, no, this is an abortion to birth. She said, absolutely not. I have a copy of the bill. I know what this bill says. I asked her to show me a copy of the bill. It was a briefing note that Alex Greenwich had put out. And she thought that, and I, you know, I understand that. Not everyone understands legislation. Um, the reporter was so upset when she found out the briefing note was a pack of lies that she was so friendly after that. And that was a mainstream media. They kept coming back and back. They would do their news um, items with our vigilers in the background. We had um, a number of regional, particularly stations doing that. And I think that really helped us get our message out there. The New South Wales community became horrified at the process of the bill and also the contents of the bill. Yes, I, because obviously local media uh, in the digital age, uh, it's easy for people interstate to consume. And obviously 2GB, uh, Alan Jones was quite uh, vocal in. Yes. Uh, he's 
uh, not strictly pro-life, but he was just aghast that this allowed abortion up until birth. So was Paul Murray, who's because Sky News, even though it's a national news network, it's based in Sydney. Uh, Caroline Marcus, she was also another, uh, she's not just a Sky News presenter, but she's also a Daily Telegraph a columnist. Uh, mm. She uh, also wrote about it. And it, it made me wonder, because this bill has been replicated, obviously it began in Victoria, that people are only discovering now that these bills allow abortion up until birth. It's basically a procedural thing for two doctors to sign off on it if it's a late term abortion. But I guess it's better late than never that people uh, are waking up that yeah, this is what the the bill says. They, because the pro-choice lobby have been very successful in in just saying that this is a private medical procedure. That's true. That's very true. And I think that that's why we're so pleased with some of the amendments that we were able to get through. That the outrage from the community actually drove a lot of those amendments. So, for example, we will now know we'll have data collected around abortions in New South Wales, and as you know, data is knowledge. Um, and knowledge is power. So we will know what's happening. And that's something we haven't had in any of the jurisdictions like Victoria or Queensland, for example, or Tasmania. We don't really know what's going on. And we're also able to modify the late term provision. So it's not just any two doctors signing off now. One must be a gynecologist, obstetrician, or have some um, real expertise in that area. And that will honestly prevent the social abortions at late term that we're seeing in other states. The, the most vocal Liberal MP during uh, the amendment process and the debate process was Tanya uh, Davies. Uh, she was the, the Minister for Women in the previous uh, parliament, but uh, interestingly, after the, the March 2019 state election, again, this wasn't discussed, the abortion issue. It wasn't raised during the election, but it was interesting, Tanya Davies, she was dumped to the backbench uh, mm. after that election. Well, she was she had already been criticised when she was made Minister for Women. How can you be the Minister for Women when you're, when you're pro-life? That did not compute for many of the, the mainstream media at that, that time. But uh, she was, well, she, she basically put her political career on the line to get these amendments through. And at the time, I thought, like, she was threatening to, to leave the, the Liberal Party. Then there was the, uh, pardon the pun, aborted spill motion. At the time, I thought, in terms of political ethics, that that was that wasn't a good path to, to go down. But the amendments got up, and upon reflecting on it, even though, though what she did was quite uh, politically high charge, sometimes the ends do justify the means. Sure, it was very messy uh, what was happening inside, and and I understand that there are a number of fights with particularly within the Liberal Party, not so much within the ALP. Although we did have some very strong ALP advocates for pro life in New South Wales, and I'm very proud of them. Uh, but Tanya Davies and Kevin Connolly, when they stood up and said, we will plunge you into a minority government if we don't get key amendments, and then fought for them outside and fought for them inside, that was really a turning point for us. There is no way we could have done it without them um, as a movement. We could not have, I can't stress that enough, actually, we cannot achieve what we achieved without strong pro-lifers inside who are willing to give up their careers for this. And that's what they were doing. They were willing to cross to the cro move to the cross bench and that would have been signing off on their careers. They would not have been re-elected after that. And it's quite uh, refreshing that there's still politicians who are willing to because, especially if you're in a major party, you're playing the political career long game. And there's, even if you it's do true. have strong views, there's, there's people who say that, oh, if you just sort of tone down this, we'll, we'll make you assistant minister, minister, you might get to be a cabinet minister one day. There's sort of all, all, all of these people in your ear saying it's about yeah. career advancement. And they also say, you can't do anything if you're, you're not here, but when do you get to do something? Very true. And I think for people like Tanya and Kevin, in the lower house and the upper house, Matthew Mason Cox and Lou Amato, who are also part of those moves, um, for them it was, this is our um, pivotal issue that we will not compromise on. We might be able to compromise a little bit on economics and infrastructure and things like that, but we cannot compromise on abortion to birth. And I'm very proud of the stand that they made. And it also helped that the, the minor parties in the New South Wales upper house, they have a very 
vocal media voice. Obviously, One Nation in New South Wales led by Mark Latham. Everyone yes. knows who he is. He's he's always got appearances on Sky News, Two GB, and got a very large uh, social media following. on Shooters, Fishers, and Farmers Party. They've been very successful in the 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 south southwest of rural New South Wales. And Rob Borsak, their their leader, he was quite vocal against this uh, legislation, which you do you do need a multitude of voices it wasn't just a, a major party uh debate but obviously the the cross bench in new south wales need them uh to pass governments need them to pass legislation and so certainly the 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 ones who decided to to make this political stitch up because that's what it was and thought they could get away with it uh, that, they didn't know what they would, what was coming. <laughs> no, I, I think they really underestimated people like Mark Latham, didn't they? Mm. When he got up in the parliament and called it a Berejiklian Greenwich government, that didn't go down too well. But he made his point, and it was true that um, the Liberals were allowing themselves to be dictated to by one independent, who you know they'd made promises to, etc. But uh, he was one person. And I think Mark Latham made that point really clearly. And I, I would not mess with him, to be honest, if I was the Liberal government or any government, to be honest. He was very strong. And as you said, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party with Rob Borzak, they were very strong. They presented our petition, which was almost 100,000 signatures in the end. And a lot of that was they truly believe they are truly pro-life, um, Robert and um, Mark Benaziak. There's also a bit of pragmatics there. They are also, their biggest competition is the National Party. And the National Party as a whole, they all voted anti-life in this bill. So that um, ability to reflect the regional and rural parts of New South Wales, who are much more pro-life than the city, we know that, we understand that's the demographics, um, to see that the shooters were actually representing their communities better than the nationals was a real political advantage for them as well. Well, people interstate might not know that the New South Wales National Party, it's very socially progressive and... Um, Regressive? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I think it was uh, Bernie Finn, your, your former colleague, who, who said they're, they're basically no different from the Greens. Why don't they just join them? Yeah. Well, I think the Greens have infiltrated them, absolutely. The Greens are more likely to get voted in in a city. The Nationals are more likely to get voted in in the country. So, yeah, there's been a lot of infiltration there. Uh, Successful infiltration. Yes. yes. Now, obviously, uh, emails, you said, can basically, uh, easily be filtered. But uh, cards which was one of the successful because they're, well, they're a bit heavy to, to put in the bin to be a bit uh, crude. But True. what uh, basically makes the politicians scared is people on the ground. And, and you had that. And that's what the left has been very successful. You have to look at, only have to look at the Extension Rebellion protesters, even though they were breaking the law, supergluing themselves uh, to, the, to the road, mm. uh, they still managed to get into the national... Uh, political conversation. Uh, you That's had two true. demonstrations which were both within the law, one outside Parliament House on a Tuesday night and then one was in Hyde Park or another? Hyde Park. Hyde Park. They yes. had 10,000 uh, right. people there which was mm. incredible and when politicians mm. see that amount of people that's that's when they start to get scared. Absolutely. So we started off small. We started off with about four, five hundred people outside Parliament House in that first week. We just went, that's it. We've got to get some people on the ground. That evolved to Martin Place, where we filled Martin Place, um, and we would have had at least five thousand people there. We also protested in between that and the Hyde Park rally outside the Liberal Party State Conference, which was run oh, at the yes. same time. Becomes... We've had about a thousand people at that, and that one's a bigger step for people because one it was a bit harder to get to um, but also to directly as a pro-life community stand outside a major political party event and call them out for what they were doing was very brave and so the thousand people that turned up there did very well and we had people like Lou Amato and Tanya Davies and Kevin Connolly come out and speak to us which also showed that they were willing to put their careers on the line they came and spoke and then they went inside uh, and voted and 
attempted to pass a motion around this bill, for example. So we were there to tangibly support them um, and to send a clear message to the Premier, who did not use the um, public entrance, by the way, for that conference. <laughs> Funny that, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and then we had the rally in Hyde Park, which was absolutely massive. It was amazing. Now, even though the the bill did eventually pass, abortion is decriminalised in, in New South Wales, that the fact that the pro Australian pro-life lobby was able to have significant victories, we're not really used to that. And so that's something, it's a, it's a starting point that we can achieve if we are able to educate the, the public, the media, that uh, we can make a difference. And I certainly saw it as a starting point that if that can be achieved, basically had two days notice, then there is there is hope that uh, victories in the, in the future are, are possible winding back these extreme uh, laws that uh, pervade our states. Uh, there can be change. Absolutely, Tim, I agree with you. I think New South Wales proved that we, as a modern movement, can step up when we need to and we can be very successful. And I've already had calls from other states saying, how can we get at least some of the amendments that you got into our bills? How can we? So there's that reawakening now of pro-life support and pro-life momentum. And I, I really think that we need to work hard together across the nation. Uh, and that's not something we've been very good at either as a pro-life movement, but we need to be working better together as a nation to um, enact changes across our states. And I should say, even though the, the media was better in New South Wales, on the whole, on the uh, issue of abortion, they're still pretty one-sided. For example, the, yes. uh, the the March for Life in, in Queensland by Cherish uh, Life, that got no media coverage at all. I was quite amazed. The, the only record that it actually took place was uh, one of uh, my friendly YouTubers, the Dusty Bogan, he goes to events in Brisbane and, and interviews people. That's the only video evidence that really? it, it, it took Goodness. place. Yeah, it and, didn't surprise me. But, mm. And uh, what I also liked, because it was still difficult to get accurate reporting on the, the debate happening place, the, the New South Wales Right to Life Facebook page, that in, in real time posted updates about which amendments had passed, uh, which had failed. And I used a lot of that on, on my uh, weeknight shows just to right. keep our audience mm. informed. So it was a very useful direct communication tool because obviously you've got people on the ground in the, in the parliament watching the, uh, the debate and it's one of the benefits of the digital age that you can bypass the, the gatekeepers. And so I thought that was very, very good source of innovation. Oh, fantastic. I'm really pleased to hear that. We really did want to make sure that people were informed in real time as to exactly what was happening. And it's very hard for most people to be able to sit and watch Parliament. I understand that. It's even hard to understand what kind of amendments were passed mm. when a vote happens in Parliament and um, to keep track of what's going on, because it can be quite a confusing and chaotic place, particularly when emotions are running high, as they do in arguments like this. So we found that a very useful tool for our members. Mm. Even if you go on the, the state parliament website and try to look it up, but there's a lot of gobbledygook you've got to get there through. certainly is. You would know there's procedures and motions. Yes. There's a lot of uh, procedural things, which the, the lay person who just mm. wants to know which amendments got up, it's very hard for them to track. Very hard. And because of our Westminster system and the way we write amendments as well, they're not emotively written. They're not written in plain English. They can actually be really difficult to understand what they're actually saying. So we tried to um, interpret that. I guess plain English is a good way of putting it um, for our audience. Now, we uh, have our annual March for the Babies uh, in Victoria uh, every October on the, the anniversary of uh, the passing of the Abortion Law Reform Act 2008 to uh, commemorate the, the babies who have been killed and also lobby for, for change. And as I've said, uh, I felt quite demoralised going to previous marches, but there was real optimism in the, the air this year. And there was around about 4,000 people who attended this year's march. Certainly uh, the successes in New South Wales had, had filtered here and inspired people to, to come out active and the, the counter protest, which 
it occurs every year, Fiona Patton makes an appearance, was they tried to scream as loudly as they could there. You, you've spoken in there, you've heard their profanity, they, 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 they couldn't, they could, oh, they couldn't scream. They they tried to scream as loud as they could, but uh, it was very difficult for, for for anyone to hear them, which was that's good. Which was good. Uh, we heard mm. from uh, Nathaniel Smith, who's one of the yes, uh, I guess you'd say freshman MPs elected at the the state election in 2019. He made very uh, passionate defence of of life, and mm. he's just a, a new MP, and that's good that he's going to be there for a long time. And obviously in Victoria, we don't have another state election until uh, 2022, which there's still another three years of, of Daniel Andrews, but we should certainly take this time to uh, regroup and oh, and look at, because we do have a model in, in New South Wales that uh, that can be be taken forward. And, and certainly, um, well, Victoria, it's always promoters the most uh, progressive states but uh, certainly that uh, if the conservative uh, groups and and you know about this in uh, as a Victorian MLC uh, there needs to be more better mobilization better networking and also better because you were a minor party MP better minor party choices come 2022 as well to put pressure on the 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 state liberals who uh, do do get uh, critiqued as being uh, quite a weak opposition at times, fairly or unfairly. Sure. I think that it's really important right now to maintain our momentum, uh, not just in New South Wales, but also in Victoria, and to just raise awareness that we need more people like Nathaniel Smith. Uh, he's, he's a great example. Uh, very strong, very outspoken, very well articulated, has a great career ahead of him in New South Wales. We need more men and women like him um, here in Victoria. So we also need to be, oh, I'm gonna, just gonna use the word bluntly, infiltrate. We need to be infiltrating the major parties as well. Make sure that we have that balance. Well, in New South Wales, we also did have, I should put a shout out to the ALP members that were very strong. So Greg Donnelly in the upper house. Uh, I think most pro-life pro-lifers know about Greg. He's a very strong advocate against abortion and against euthanasia. But we also saw some new people such as uh, Courtney Husos in the upper house. She's an ALP member and she very strongly stood up um, and spoke out against uh, the abortion bill. And I think that's very brave and we need more people like that as well. Yes, because it is a free vote in the, the Labor caucus, uh, but uh, uh, they, they, they do well, uh, there's a lot of pressure on the the pro-life Labor MPs to keep quiet, but they've always uh, been around. Uh, people don't know that, well, there's two Molino brothers in the Victorian Parliament, obviously Daniel Molino, who's the Deputy Premier, and James Molino, who was one of your colleagues in the, uh, the Upper House, they're firmly pro-life and it was good that uh, Daniel Molino, he found his voice during the, the euthanasia debate oh. and, and, and took it up to uh, his... Daniel was very well articulated. Unfortunately, we've left, lost him from the state. He's now a federal member, uh, but that's actually good as well. We need his voice federally. We need him to be replaced in the state as well so that we have that strong pro-life voice. Remembering that in euthanasia, we only lost in Victoria by two votes. That's not a lot. Mm. For a state like Victoria, that's not a lot. It looks like in Western Australia, they'll lose by a lot more than that. So this is the danger of things starting in one state and then spreading. And we need to maintain that momentum as well. Uh, you mentioned Western Australia, where they're they're trying to, to ram through euthanasia. They've got the 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 state Liberal, National, Labor, and Green leaders all on side, and so they thought that they could just pass it pass it through. They see there seems to be the the, the people at the top of of these parties. You could call it ivory tower syndrome. They just think, well, if we all agree to just ram it through, yes. then it will. But they forget that uh, uh, any uh, local resident can send in a letter, send in email, make the phones go into to meltdown, protest outside the the, the state parliament. They've and, and the even if it's not them, but they're 
their backbenchers tell them that there's the public's revolting. You're absolutely right, Tim. It's they do live in a bubble and they do tend to forget that there are voters out there that will not vote their way just because they say they will. Uh, I don't know who advises some of these leaders, to be honest. And that's another thing we need to be keeping in mind, that we need people in these advisory positions who actually have a reality check for these leaders who think that they can get away with this. Now, the Liberal Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, and the Deputy uh, Premier National, John Barilaro, they've been keen to to put this behind them now, but uh, many of the the, the, the pro-life advocates I spoke to in New South Wales have said, we're not going to forget this uh, 2023. And there are, as we mentioned, there there are alternatives in New South Wales, Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, uh, One Nation under Mark Latham, uh, Australian Conservatives uh, that deregistered at a federal level and Christian Democrats, it looks like, uh, that uh, once Fred Nile passes on, that that party will struggle to, to find relevance. I did interview Ricardo Bossi, who was Australian Conservatives uh, candidate. He's launched an Australia One uh, party, and yeah, on my show he he was like, "We're coming for you, Gladys. You've got to be very afraid." And uh, uh, Ricardo's former uh, military officer. And, He's very strong. Yes. Yes. So. Uh, everyone's going to have a, a long memory. And so if Gladys and, and John think that 2023, everyone's... Because that used to be in the past that the the news cycle would just move on. And the the mainstream media, they do run a protection racket a lot of the time for the, the, the politicians. But the internet's forever. But citizens can look, thing, look things up that, yes, this happened three or four years ago and we're not going to forget. Absolutely. We really want to send a clear message to the leaders in New South Wales and the key people that brought this in, the 15 co-sponsors, for example, that we will not forget. This was not done in our name and we will be after uh, lower house and upper house seats in the next election. We will fill that parliament with pro-lifers to the best of our ability. And that's minor parties, major parties will be getting involved in pre-selections. And that's something that even Right to Life New South Wales are recognising that we need to become much more politically active in the future. And we are making plans around that. Oh, well, I've appreciated it that obviously you've been very busy and you've been in another state, but I was very glad that uh, you've been able to make the time to, to come uh, and speak with me because yes, you've obviously had a busy time and there's there's a lot to both ask you about and and praise you. Obviously, it's coming down to the, the end of the year, unless there's another surprise thing. How exhausting has it been, this? Oh, it has been exhausting. Yes. Um, I mean, we were working 16 hour days just to during this, you know, two months, two months is not a long time for no. a campaign. <laughs> so, you know, we worked, but we always kept in mind that the end goal and, you know, we're there to defend life and we can rest later. We had to keep going, um, eye on the prize. And while we didn't defeat the bill, we were able to make some significant changes and we were able to gain such momentum that I do believe we will make a difference in the next New South Wales state election. Yeah, I don't doubt that. Well, mm. congratulations on your work so far. I'll just say uh, enjoy taking a breather, but who knows what can be sprung at any moment. That's, that's the thing. <laughs> that is very true. That is very true. We are not resting. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.